Well, welcome to Speechless. We're glad to have you here live from the SCC studios in White Bear Lake, also playing live over SPNN in St. Paul. I think we've got a fascinating show today. It's going to be covering the 2020 show, uh, Footprints in the Snow. Uh, that was last Friday night regarding the Sandra Grazzini Rucky, David Rucky divorce and missing children's case. And uh, it's going to take the whole hour. That's all we're going to do. <laughs> because uh, a lot of breaking news, a lot of new stuff happening. And there's too much to cover in an hour. That's just the way it is. And that's what I would have to begin my summary with, with the ABC 2020 coverage of the case. There's too much to cover and to do it in an hour, and actually because of commercials, they have a lot less time. Of course, it's commercial free TV, so we have a little bit extra time. <laughs> the um, show, I thought, did an excellent job laying out the players and getting you the names of the players and giving you a feel for what's going on. Um, they slanted it against Sandra quite a bit, I, I would think, uh, that she definitely looks guilty in what she's doing. But I would say a lot of information was given in a short amount of time. I think what's terribly difficult to understand in this whole process is a timeline. And there's a lot of information that was left out. But things were said in different ways. In other words, one way, something was said one way, and then later on the show, what you remember hearing was said in a different way, and you kind of brought the two together, although they were saying different things. And we're going to show you an example of that, especially when it deals with abuse allegations uh, that took place. <clears throat> uh, but to start off, let's go with the lower uh, video there and start off with the first one, uh, which I think was, was very, was probably one of the key things of this show and one of the key issues that I don't think got answered. But let's, let's watch. 13-year-old Gianna and 14-year-old Samantha Rucky disappear. The only trace, footprints in the snow. But oddly, there is no manhunt to find the girls no police press conference. How can two children in the state of Minnesota be gone and no one knows where they are? Great question. And I think that is the question that needs to be happening, it needs to be answered, and needs to be answered for thousands of other cases. But even in that case, I mean, that, that's just the start. How can they be missing and nobody knows where they're at? And then second, how could they be found? Yet you as a parent, even though you have a court order to see them, you don't get to see them. And the system will do nothing. And my question is, what's the difference? What if you're missing? Well, what if they're, they're found and you still don't get to see them? And you have a court order that says you get to see them. So a lot of, you got to have real good ears to hear what's going on here. The next uh, video here, that question gets relayed again uh, later on, about halfway through, but in a different manner. So let's hear what... Yeah. Normally, two teenage girls vanishing into thin air would be the top story on the local news. But that's not the case here in Minneapolis. There is no Amber Alert, no search parties combing the woods. Why? Why? Two girls missing? Why didn't it happen? What, what was the deal with the Lakeville police? Why wasn't there an Amber Alert? The report was these girls ran away. Okay, are, are they then missing? So say they ran away, nobody knows where they are. The mother, the father said they don't know where they are. Well, after a certain period of time, why don't why don't you start looking for them? That's, I, we don't know. Okay, what took place. 
Um, and I don't think I wrote this. Let's let's play the next clip. Uh, that's Did on you call this. the police? I had an order not to contact the police. You have a right to contact the police really? if you're a victim of a crime or if I you're have a court in order danger. From Judge Knutson, that I am not to contact the police. But this court order directly contradicts that, specifically stating that Sandra should report any information she has about the girl's whereabouts to authorities. So you did nothing when you found out they were missing then? Okay, I, I guess if you're in that situation where you've been stripped of everything related to your children, you don't know what to do. If one of my children went missing, I'd be out there with a sandwich board saying, find my child. The courts have completely tied my hands. All right. You got to listen to what's being said here. The question was, if my kids are missing, I'd be out there with a sandwich board trying to find them. Now what if it happens if you change the question, if my kids are being abused, I would be out there doing everything to protect my kids from the abuse, wouldn't you? So if you change the question from missing to abused, all of a sudden you see a whole different scenario being played out here. So part of this story is kind of saying, hey, this is about missing children. But then when you change it to abused children, the, the relationship, the behavior of a parent should change. In other words, if they're missing, you're a parent, you're out there looking, okay? If they're abused, you put them in a safe place, I'm not telling you where they're at. They're safe. I'm fine with that. I, and I'm not going to tell you where they're at, and I'm not going to let you know that I know where they're at. So, that, that's interesting. The, the other thing that's happened in, in this case is that um, from what I understand is that there was a hearing to be had on where are the killed children put, put in by Sandra and her attorney. But guess what happened? My understanding is Judge Knudsen canceled the hearing. So why did that happen? Who knows? But, you know, that's just part of the deal. Okay, let's uh, go to the next video here. As she reaches her breaking point and finally files for divorce. She says, frightened for her life, she also gets an order of protection against David. And then she calls police on him at least 20 times, claiming he continuously violates it. He broke into the house, came running up the stairs, jumped onto the bed that I was at, started choking me, and then took a pillow and started suffocating me. All right. You know, when did that happen? Did that happen before the divorce papers or after the divorce papers? And, and one thing that the, you know, things went by so fast. So you got a single sentence that's being said in the story. And, and then, it, then it's never said and you never hear about that particular aspect. But there was a divorce prior, and Sandra was awarded custody of the children. That, they said that. ABC 2020 said that. What you didn't hear was that it was a uncontested divorce. It was a default judgment because David didn't show up. He had a signature on the divorce paper. I read the transcripts. The judge is going, uh, okay, where is he? He's not here. He said he didn't want to be here. He just was fine with the divorce the way it was. He had a notarized signature on the paper. The judge says, okay. Uh, he looked it over. He looked, this, this looks fair based on the information here. And the divorce was granted, okay? Couple things about the divorce in that situation. The property, from what I've seen in divorce cases, was divided, that looked like it was divided fairly. David Knudsen got his business, all his business assets. Sandra got the home, 
all, in her, all of her inheritance assets because they were substantial. Uh, and Sandra got full custody of the kids. What I didn't like about the court order was that there was nothing, and this is on the judge, but it's also on David or on Sandra, who knows, where it was left up to one person or basically left up to the kids to decide when they wanted to see the other per, uh, parent. Okay, I don't, I, that just doesn't work in, in divorce situations. You don't leave it up to the kids. Uh, you, you, it's an adult thing, so the adult need, need to work that out, but thousands of divorces are done that way, and thousands of orders are done that way in, in divorce case, which, again, I don't think is a, a, a good thing. Well, in the, in the end, um, the, um, David gets served the divorce, final divorce. And in, in the storyline, he, not, not on ABC, you don't hear this, he flips out, you know. He goes, what is this? I didn't know I was getting a divorce. So he reopened the case, okay, and in reopening the case, you listen to his testimony to find out his, his time of event. He says, hey, I was defrauded. I didn't know what I was signing. Now understand, David Rutke has a trucking business that had anywhere from one to uh, six million dollars of revenue running through the company. Uh, you're, you're signing contracts. You got attorneys. Uh, you don't go and son or notarize a piece of paper and a signature with lettering on it and words on it without knowing what it is. You don't do that. Okay, but he says he didn't know what was on the paper he got signed and notarized. Okay, so the first case happened to be before Judge Warmanger. Okay, the second case was reopened before David Knudsen, who my understanding at that time assigned himself to the case. It didn't go through the normal channels of getting assigned to him by the administration. He took it, okay, which raises some questions. That's my understanding, okay. So David Knudsen reopened the case and in the short hearing uh, determined that there was fraud. Sandra had put fraud on the court, reopened the case, and then took custody away from both of the parents, okay. I don't think that was in the ABC 2020 report. Neither parent had custody at that point in time. Okay, and, and Sandra, uh, um, but they still could see their kids and Sandra was still in her house. Okay, well, <clears throat> let's go on to, uh, that's, that's kind of a beginning there. So let's go on to the uh, next, uh, video on the lower side. What would he do? Throw things, hammers at me. If he got mad, um, there was black eyes, there was broken ribs. We had to lock ourselves in the bedroom because we scared. We just didn't know how his behavior was going to be from one day to the next. During all those years during the marriage, did you ever take any photos, ever seek yes. medical help? We had photos and we had police reports that prove it. Okay. <clears throat> We're back on the abuse issue because that goes dealing with before the divorce. Okay, in the divorce papers, I did not see uh, from the Warmanger case any mention of abuse. Okay, they could be there. I just don't recall them right now, and I didn't see I didn't see everything that was there in that court case. Okay, but I don't recall mention of abuse. It was just done. It was settled. It could have been something that was held over David's head that said, "Hey, you know what?" here's the deal, you've been abusive, we could raise that or we can uh, settle, you know, we can just settle this way. So, you know, who knows exactly, but those were the allegations before the abuse. Now, oh, forgot to turn this off. Uh, I'm going to turn that down. So, 
what happened um, but here the case got so blown out of hand in my opinion because of the way David Knutson these abuse issues then had to come into play uh, in in order to try to have custody or keep custody so um, let's go to the top line what we're going to get this is for the video people here uh, we're going to get the first impression of what uh, Michelle McDonald and her husband had of the 2020 uh, program and what they thought about it. So let's play that. They only had an hour, that's all I can say. Um, I think it, it does show how could this happen to a family. And both of them, I mean the whole family was devastated. And, and the sad part is they started touching on what the family courts, their intervention into with the family lives. And this was all after the divorce. There's no reason that it should lead to this much uh, trouble where it's even the state involvement in the counties going from look on the big manhunt for people. And this was all post the divorce was settled. It was post uh, trial or what is that what you call it? Post trial. Mm -hmm. And the, the divorce was already settled. Uh, for the children to be uh, put in this situation, um, you, they always hear about, and, and I've heard of cases where they talk about having kids visit in a safe house. So for the mother to just lose custody and not have an intervention with the father in, his, in a safe place, it seems so ridiculous that it was such an extreme that, that the mother was lost custody just on an order and there was no intervention in a, in a, uh, a much lesser level and something that makes sense in which they do all the time in daily life. And for to this extreme, to devastate the family, and like I said, even involve so many more people from the county and the state is ridiculous. The uh, very good points he made, and, and this is what I would say is the, the extremism by the courts in the county that, that took place here. Um, Judge Knudsen was issuing tons of order before there was evidentiary hearings, uh, after evidentiary hearings and in betweens where there weren't evidentiary hearings, <laughs> okay? He had tons of orders going on. And I mean, and we're gonna see the tons of boxes in this case, but the extremism that takes place in this, it just didn't have to happen. So Judge Knutson reopens the case, and then they, then uh, David Ruckey's put in motions. I want to see my kids. I'm not getting to see my kids. They bring in the accuse of uh, alienating the parents, or alienating the children from the parents. They bring in a psychologist. Michelle McDonald's not an attorney on any of this part of it. Uh, and actually there was two lawyers prior to Michelle ever being involved. And what happened is there was a hearing, an emergency hearing with the child psychologist or, or the uh, alienation expert. Uh, and he had deemed in a very, very short conversation that uh, Sandra was alienating the children from the husband. It was an emergency. They needed to get the children out of the, the parents, out of the children's lives and get Sandra out. At this point, Sandra had custody of the kids. She was living with the kids. And in a matter of two hours, Sandra was ordered out of the house. All she could take was a suit, suitcase of clothes. Now, understand this, that Sandra was not there at that emergency hearing. It was a phone conversation. She did not know about it. She found out after the fact when her attorney told her that the Judge Knudsen had issued an order. Sandra did not get to talk to her attorney. The, the child, uh, the, the, I don't know what his name is, um, uh, Gilbertson or whatever, the psychologist, wasn't cross-examined. Sandra's attorney went along with everything 
And Sandra wasn't there to say anything. There was no rebut of anything. And so all of a sudden, you're out of, I mean, this is so bizarre. This is so backwards. Okay, an emergency, all right, but you got no defense. Now, I, of course, they made it an, an emergency, okay, so therefore they can, you know, it's like, okay, uh, the police come, they've heard there's a crime taking place, you arrest people, you, you know, you, things move along. You know, you lose some of your liberties for a while. You're thrown out of your house, okay? You didn't get to cross-examine anybody. So, and here's a fundamental right that's going on in our family court cases. You go to these psychologists and you're expected to answer their questions. But you don't know where the psychologist's philosophy is. You don't know whether they're pro-fathers, pro-mothers, pro-kids. Uh, anti-fathers, anti-mothers, anti-kids. You don't know what their mindset is. You don't know what agenda they have going in. You don't even have your attorney there. And that psychologist will go into the court and they can say things that you said that you didn't say. There's nothing on the record. And all of a sudden, boom, like that, your kids are gone and, and you're out. And People take the assumption, since the court dealt with it and since the experts dealt with it, that, you know, we really don't question them. Well, that's, not, that's the mistake. And actually, that's how the system wants you to think. And you hear it all the time. Well, the court made this decision. Oh, okay, wow, you know, that's the way it is. Somebody that's an expert must have looked into all of this. And those were some of the comments that's going out over the web. Somebody must have looked into this, all this. But what happens, that's where they want you, okay? Well, didn't the judge say this? Didn't the psychologist say that? And if you start to think, oh, the experts, that's, that's right where they want you. Because then you stop questioning. Then you stop thinking. And then you stop finding out what's really going on. And that's what in my opinion, was take, is taking place here with a lot of people out there. We don't question the judge, and we don't question the psychologist. Everything else is open, open to game, but it's actually the judge and the psychologist that do need to be questioned in this situation. Uh, and, and in response, let's go to the upper one, the next uh, video, uh, hope, disappointment. Um, that's what this couple had to say about their disappointment in the ABC 2020 movie. I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, I, we both, I think, I've been praying a lot that uh, some media, or mainstream media, would pick up on uh, the hidden secret of the various different cor uh, corruptions within the court systems and whatnot. And, uh, was actually very hopeful that 2020 would do an investigative report and I uh, was really looking forward to watching the episode tonight. I'd have to be honest that uh, I was very disappointed. The story came out to be about he said, she said, another uh, couples divorcing, um, very brief mention of uh, the courts and the judges and how they operate um, behind closed doors. and. Uh, whether it's ethical or not. Um, I was under the impression that that's what uh, 2020 was investigating. And uh, there was, appears to be a lot of uh, holes and uh, a lot of things left out. So I'd have to say that, yeah, I'm, I, I guess I'm disappointed. Not surprised, obviously, but uh, nevertheless, I'd say disappointed. There's a lot of information about our court system and how the family court um, winks and nods at each other to uh, get things done and uh, not really for the best interest of the children or sometimes it's more so for the best interest of the attorneys and the judges or the county mostly but that didn't seem to um, didn't get discussed the information didn't seem to come out so um, I'll continue to pray that uh, this may be a catalyst for perhaps another um, 
organization, uh, news organizations or media organization that may find uh, courage to uh, really talk about what's going on in, in our court system, in a judicial system. So I'll continue to pray. <clears throat> we should all continue to pray for this family that reunification will happen in one way or another. Uh, that everybody doesn't start strangling each other and that relationships get restored and that they can be done in such a way that you know the court doesn't have to punish people <laughs> you know um, and that hopefully people have learned their lessons if there's lessons to learn and I think there are lessons to learn in this situation okay let's go to the next video on the bottom uh, We'll get back to the abuse this issue. This is Sandra Grazzini Recchi's basically divorce case. We spend hours there scouring thousands of documents and in more than 20 boxes, we didn't find a single piece of paper or photo to prove that any physical abuse ever happened. So we reached out to the Lakeville Police Department and they have no record of ever being contacted by Sandra about abuse during her marriage. Here's the uh, interesting thing that just blows my mind here. See, some of these questions are about pre-divorce and some are after divorce. And, and the questions are asked over a different period of time. This investigation, you know, by 2020 went on for quite a while. Uh, it's a good five, six month investigation, I believe. And so some of the interviews are at the beginning and some at the end, <laughs> okay? so. I don't know anything personally pre-divorce. To say that, and that was the caveat the Lakeville police said, there's no allegations of abuse before the divorce. But the whole questioning of 2020 was more about, there is no evidence of abuse at all. Okay, now I'm perfectly, I mean, I mean I'm a person that perfectly understands the nature of divorce cases and that once the divorce is filed, things get heated up a little bit. I think the court should be a lot more merciful than they are after those situations arise, especially if nobody's getting hurt, but there's yelling and going on and stuff like that. Well. 20, 2020, so that's kind of what they presented, no abuse. But what they, what they left out was that there was abuse, at least after the divorce, and that people did testify there was abuse during the marriage. So let's, uh, let's go to the next video and hear what's said about abuse during the marriage. The local Fox 9 station airs this story, and right there, sitting in front of the reporter, are the two missing Rucky sisters. I'm just really scared it's going to end really badly. And once again, they back up what Sandra has been saying. He was abusive. Really? In what way? Emotionally, verbally. I mean, our mom was always our protector, but now there's no one there to protect us. I was glad to see my girls, but, you know, what I was hearing coming out of their mouths was hard. And as quickly as you can change the channel, the girls are gone again, vanishing back into the night. Months pass. Their faces appear on the missing and exploited children's website and on thousands of plastic bags distributed in northern Minnesota. The search continues for the Rucky girls. Their parents' epic divorce drags on until the judge finally makes his ruling. In a painstaking 60-page order, he drops a bombshell, awarding full custody of all five children to David, writing of Sandra's allegations of abuse that the court has not received any evidence to support her very serious allegations. He went on to say Sandra refused to cooperate with any of the professionals appointed in this case. Now there, there that's very, very interesting. Now. 
in my understanding of this timeline of the 60 uh, of, of the 60 page order that happened September 11th 2013 and September 12th that's the case where Michelle McDonald was arrested during the hearing and put into custody and was forced to come back to the trial you're gonna have to look at past shows and uh, defend her client in a wheelchair without her glasses, without her shoes, without her client, again without the client, hear this? Client's not there, okay? Any attorney knows something really screwy's going on. The client was there, but the client was told to go home, okay? Her attorney just got arrested. And then two hours later, she's back in the courtroom, the attorney's back in the courtroom, but everybody been told nothing's happening here, go home. And the court records are gone. Okay, so what you don't get from the feel of 2020 is the timeline of this and that this is really a lot later in the sequence. Okay, and, and she, Michelle believes she was chained to that wheelchair. Okay, and the judge told her, you, def you either finish the case or it's going to be a default judgment. So what basically happened is Sandra did not get to testify and also there was the evidence wasn't able to be presented because the paperwork was gone it was taken away what was she to do that's the cover-up that's the atrocity of David Knudsen in the Minnesota courts that's what they're covering up they don't want you to know that and for some reason 2020 knew all about this and the employees and the staff of 2020 that was working on this were appalled by what they heard. They saw the video, videos online, it's played it on the show. They're appalled by it. But, you know, who, who cares? The Board of Judicial Standards, who cares? You know, judges do whatever they want. Okay, so 2020 kind of makes it and is applying no evidence of abuse. And everybody's saying, a judge said no evidence of abuse. Well, they don't understand. Evidence wasn't allowed to be presented because of the scam that, in my opinion, Judge David Knudsen ran. But 2020 played the Channel 9 report, but they didn't play this part of the Channel 9 report. So let's go to the next lowercase video. And then Why I would a judge do that if he really father. thought you were being abused? That might, that looked like the, well, let's play that one anyway. <laughs> oh, is that it? Okay, play it again because I uh, missed it. In those videos, Damon discussed the abuse he says he suffered. I told police about this. I told psychologists, I even told the judge, and yet somehow it was all covered up in lies. Today, Damon is an activist working with an organization called the Women's Coalition. He blames the court for forcing him into his life on the run. Even though Damon's father strenuously denies ever abusing his son, and a judge agreed there was no credible evidence to prove it happened. He said that whether or not I was being abused, my mom had to stop talking about abuse. And that why I would a judge do that if he really father. thought you were being abused? It's a good question, but you know what? I hear about that all the time. You know, uh, that, that goes on all the time. And judges don't set up a scenario where people can present their evidence. And, and I'm going to, judges are put in a tough spot in some of these cases because neither side presents their evidence very well. Or one side does a great job, another side does a, 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 that may have all the evidence, but they don't do as well. Okay? But it's a tough spot for everybody. But when a judge won't allow the evidence to be heard, that's a whole different story. And that's what's coming up in the, the eventual trial here because so far from what I understand, of Sandra Grazzini, the girls aren't going to get to testify. They've been ruled out uh, for some reason because they're minors, you know, they don't get to cross-examine or tell the story.
But here, what I did like about the story, they did start talking about the underground that I guess is out there. I never heard about it until, you know, following this case and other people started mentioning it. None of the people that I'm associated, that is associated here in the story and that I know from the story. Um, but it was interesting what they didn't tell you and what they tried to imply that if you're in the underground, you're not going to school. It's hard, it's depressing, and kids think about suicide. Well, that was that guy's experience. But what you saw in the movie was the girls were thriving, they were getting good grades, or they were being homeschooled, and once they got back to public school, they're getting great grades and, and doing well. And all the reports from everybody is that the kids were out in public, they were using their same name, and this was done on this, this was done in 2020, and uh, nobody was hiding anything. And the girls were told, hey, leave. You know, no, we're not going to leave. We don't want to go back to the abuse. It's a tough deal. Well, let's go next to the next lowercase video. Sandra's argued the kids don't want to see their dad because he's frightened them. She's submitted transcripts of angry voicemails and texts left on the kids' cell phones. This is crazy stuff your mom's doing. What the f is wrong with you? You know what? You don't understand. She's also submitted a voicemail she believes came from him and includes the sound of what she says is six gunshots, one she says for each family member. David Rucky says he doesn't have a gun. And there's this story. The last on our kitchen table and said that he was going to shoot all of us. He had six gunshots. He was going to shoot all of us, my mom included. I think I said was basically, what do you want me to just put a bullet in my head and end it so you don't have to deal with this? All right. 2020 said no evidence of abuse, physical, no physical evidence of abuse. But you see, there's more than just physical evidence. There's verbal evidence. There's people telling testimony. You'd rather see physical evidence, a video or whatever. But my understanding is that audio recording of the gunshots has been traced back to David Rucky. 2020 didn't tell you about that. Channel 9 did. In 2020, played Channel 9's report and said there's no evidence of abuse, or trying to imply that there's no evidence of abuse, but they parsed the word, there's no physical evidence of abuse. Okay, well, that means that at least meets the definition of terroristic threat. Okay, and an order for protection was put out and has been put out before Sandra lost the kids. And what's very very interesting to me is that you have an order for protection and if you violate it people are violating uh, going to jail for violating an order for protection when they text uh, the person that uh, they're, they're not to be texting and say hey I really I want to see my kids you know or you know remember that's my property, don't sell it, you know. Uh, one, they shouldn't do that. They should know better than that. Should work through their attorneys, okay. But a lot of people can't afford attorneys. They, that's what it takes to violate an order for protection and go to jail. In the prior video we said, saw that, or in the video we saw that Lakeville police said there's no allegations of abuse prior to the divorce. The thing didn't talk about the allegations in the order for protections after the divorce and how many times David Rucky did violate them. My only question on that is why did the police in Lakeville act so differently than other police saying there are no police reports? Well, there's tons of police reports. Okay? <laughs> I've seen the police I have them here. I you know, there are tons of police reports in this case. There are a number of violations for the order for protection that nothing took place. There's a warrant out for David Rucky's arrest and an officer went to arrest him. Instead the officer followed him to the bank so he could make a withdrawal to get the money to pay uh, the, the fine for the warrant. It is very very interesting. All right. 
you heard what David Rocky say, you know, and it's a tough situation to be in when you're losing your kids. Okay, um, so why why is there gel for Sandra and not for her husband? You know what's going on, and and deprivation of parental rights or custodial rights is what she was charged under, six hundred nine point two six. Um, you don't you don't get jail time for that. You get a slap on the hand. Don't do it again. If you do it again, boom. You know. Well, then we'll send you to jail. So, what's going on here? I I personally believe if you're depriving parental rights, yes, you should um, uh, spend some time in jail. Uh, but it didn't happen. Well, David Ruckey's attorney had these comments to say about his threats. They probably had a short temper. There are five kids and things get crazy. Um, did he ever harm them? No. Did um, he ever stalk them? No. Did he threaten them? No. All right. N not according to what you heard from the kids. Okay. I want to introduce uh, one of the players in the... Uh, that was also charged, D.D. Evavold, and um, let's let's see the next video. See what they say about D.D. Dee Dee because she's and police here. The trail begins with one of Sandra's staunchest supporters, D.D. Evavold, an activist friend, vocal about her belief there is corruption in the family courts. Did all right. What a lot of people were hoping to hear that ABC 2020 would acknowledge there's something going on with the courts. 2020 did not acknowledge that or some, some type of corruption, some type of misbehavior by the courts in this process. That did not happen. What they did do is allow for other people to say that they believe the Minnesota courts, the family law courts are bad. So let's go to that. Um, Let's go to DD2 and next video, play that. DD Evavold not only knew Sandra, she knew the Dolans and respected their work on the ranch. I knew that these are good, honest, salt of the earth people that really are just about doing the right thing. It's just interesting to note, uh, DD Evavold had an eight hour interview with ABC 2020. That was her one sentence in the in the story, you know. I mean, there's a lot of information to cover, but that's just an interesting aside. Um, so, and Dee Dee admits driving the kids to the Dolans, um, and that she did it because she thought the kids were being abused. Uh, so, let's, uh, you know, those two videos uh, you put the wording on. Let's, let's show the first one there of those two, or just any one of them for that matter. Dale says he knew that the children had already been taken out of Sandra's custody and that by driving off with them, she was breaking the law. Sandra was busy telling the police she had no idea where the girls had gone, and you knew Sandra was lying. I thought she was, yeah. Well, you knew she was because you were in the car with her. That's true. Right. You're right. So if you knew she was lying about that, why didn't you go to police and say, I know what really happened? I think Sandra was trying to protect her children. I wasn't going to betray that. Dale insists he couldn't help even if he wanted to. He doesn't know where Sandra ended up taking the girls. Uh, Dale Nathan, um, and I was going to do more on this, but I, I messed up. So I'm going to save it for next week. Uh, he has helped a lot of people uh, in very, very tough situations, a lot of people in desperate situations, giving them information that helps them just to get to the next day, you know, and he's, he's just helped a lot of people. And, and somehow he got mixed into this case, and he was helping out Sandra Grazzini Rucky. Um, and that was the nature of Dell right there. I mean, that just, that video, that 
just describes how he is. Dale's a person who calls it as he sees it, tells the truth as he experienced it, and um, you know, he, he, he's very old and frail now. What, what he remembers, does he remember it all correctly? I don't know. But that, you know, uh, when Elizabeth Vargas questioned Dell, you know, Dell made a statement that she came back and, and said, well, you should make that stronger. Well, he did, <laughs> you know. So uh, let's watch the next video on, on Dell Nathan. Dale Nathan, a diminutive 81-year-old who has spent years working as an attorney in custody cases. Dale had his legal license suspended after he refused to reveal where one of his clients was in hiding with her child. He is a fervent supporter of Sandra. Dale is somebody who believes to the bone that the family courts in Minnesota are corrupt. See, <clears throat> it was... ABC 2020 got the in the corruption of the courts based on what other people said. Firmly believes to the bone that the system is corrupt. And I, I thought it was interesting. Um, people are saying he, he lost his law license uh, for assisting a client and he lost it for violating court orders involving a custody dispute. You know, and People are saying that. He, he lost it because he violated a court order. But what was the court order? If you read the transcripts and you see what happened in the court order, the court order said, uh, you disclose where this mother took the child. And Dale's telling the court, I don't know where she took the child. I don't know if she has the child. And the court's telling Dale Nathan, as an attorney, you need to tell me, you need to tell me, Judge Blakely, Hmm, who's he? You need to tell me, Judge Blakely, where, what, you, what your client told you. And Dale goes, she didn't tell me anything about where the child is or what's going on. I don't know where it is. Ju Judge Blakely uh, sentenced, uh, threw him in court or in jail for contempt of court, and he was there for seven weeks. See, and this is how the court system gets around following the Constitution, following the laws. You have attorney-client privilege, and there the court order was for Dell to violate attorney-client privilege. And therefore, he gets thrown in jail. Uh, charges, ethical charges get brought against Dell Nathan to the, the Professional Lawyers Responsibility Board. He loses his license all the way up to the Minnesota Supreme Court because of that. And because Dale said bad things about the court. Okay, well, if the court is making you break the law and you can't say bad things about that, what kind of court system do we have? It's a broken system. Did you know that Judge Blakely was... Um, disciplined by the Supreme Court for uh, sending divorce cases to uh, a psychologist friend of his, and he was getting uh, a little kickback, or so there was some reduction going on uh, in attorney's fees, or, uh, or he would, you know, anyway, he got suspended for six months, he ran for re-election and he lost, okay? Uh, you know, th there's a lot more to these stories than, than just what's on the surface going on here. Okay, um, I'm going to do more on this next week. I want to do more this week, but I couldn't. Uh, Dell watched the show in a hospital Friday night. The next morning uh, he died. And I got to find out more about what he died from. But I, I think it's interesting that Dale had been pushing, he'd been down at the legislature for years and years trying to talk about the problems with the court system. And this finally went national that he was able to talk about it. Uh, there's other things, and next week I will talk to you about what he had to say about how he's treated in the hospital. Uh, not good. Uh, and so anyway, he, he died Saturday morning.
um, and we'll, we'll talk about, but I appreciate Dell's life. Now let's get back to this case here. So you're kicked out of your house all of a sudden. Two hours to get out. You only can take a suitcase full of your clothes. Um, father doesn't have custody either. Who gets custody of the kids? Let's watch the next clip here. B bottom level, uh, Tammy. After Tammy becomes the children's temporary guardian, she moves into the Rucky home to take care of them. All right. Interesting. How does she become temporary guardian? Well, she wasn't the only one. That's David Rucky's sister. Uh, Sandra uh, Rucky's sister was also a temporary custodian, guardian of the kids. They moved into Sandra's home. M mind you, they had a couple of homes. David had his home, Sandra had hers. They had different homes. Sandra gets kicked out. These two people move in. My understanding is Tammy Love lost custody of her kids. And when I read the transcript, you know what? There was no talk about whether she's qualified or anything like that. Sandra's attorney didn't know anything about Tammy Love. And she just went, she went along with it. Of course, Sandra wasn't there to tell her the story and what was going on. All this was last minute hectic stuff. You didn't have any clue what was going on. It was an emergency, you know. Well, there wasn't one, but that's, that's what happens. Okay, we got too much video. They, they warned me of that. Uh, I had too much. Uh, let's go on the bottom line to the second to the last one, lawyer's protection. Uh, watch that video. Just catch that one. Well, my sense is, is that the... Um, the lawyers have a legal society, and the legal society is not going to throw the judicial branch under the bus. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's lawyers in control over at ABC, and they're going to control the content that gets shown over there. So in this segment, we saw very clearly, they started to bring up some evidence with the, with the judge not doing stuff correct, or what was going on with the judicial branch, with the orders that was going on. None of that stuff got dug into by the story to find out how did the court have corruption to actually cause and exacerbate this problem. Why? Because people don't want to shine a light on the fact that the judicial branch causes or exacerbates this problem. So the lawyers are protecting their own within this society. So, and, and how do I know that? Well, ABC has its own lawyers and they're going to protect their own content. So the judges in this case in the legal society are not going to get exposed for causing a problem. So that's the real, that's to me is the real tragedy of part of this story is that the, um, <clears throat> um, we live in a legal society and it's a, not a government of the people, by the people, for the people, but really it's a government of the lawyers, by the lawyers, for the lawyers. And the lawyers are going to protect one another, whether they're a prosecutor, whether they're attorney general, whether they're a, a, a district court judge or a Supreme Court judge, they're all members of the legal society and including the legislature where the majority of them make the laws. So the lawyers are going to protect other lawyers. It's a legal society. It's a protection racket. And they're not doing what they need to do. And what's evidence, what's sad is on a story like this, if they start to go after it, they might begin to wake up the people to what's really going on. But if you ask people anything and they say it's the law, people get scared. They don't even think about it. Their, their mind just shuts off. And why do they do that? Well, because they think, well, they got to have an advanced law degree or lawyer or whatever, but people get scared. They won't even figure out that, you know, what it is. And the lawyers are running a protection racket and the people are saying, well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. Well, the fact is <clears throat> the lawyers are running a racket and the people are getting sucked in on it. And you can't have an industry controlling our lives. And that's essentially what's happening, and it's not getting exposed on TV. And 2020 is not doing their job to expose this because they're controlled by lawyers at the top of the corporation. That's it in a nutshell. John Miser there, pretty good summary uh, of what, what he thought is taking place. <laughs> um, let's go to the next video. I think this is uh, apropos and, and the last one, end of legislature. 
uh, kind of telling what people have been through in this process. The saddest part of this uh, Sandra Gazzini Recchi uh, deal is that it didn't need to happen. We are here in the year 2016. Every year since 2005, hundreds of Minnesotans have went down to the Minnesota legislature and asked them for a hearing dedicated to receiving evidence and testimony of corruption in the Minnesota courts. Every year they've denied us. Worse than deny us, they've retaliated against some of us. Some people have left the state. At least one person has left the country to get away from the reprisal and retaliation. It is sad that more families like Sandra Grazzini, Grazzini Rookie's family have to go through these travesties because our state legislature just doesn't want to hear and acknowledge the corruption in the Minnesota judiciary system. That's Don Mashak, a judicial reform uh, activist, um, and he, he's so true. This didn't have to happen. And well, you know what? ABC got a lot of information in their time. I don't think I did as good of a job. I hope I'm giving you more information. Uh, go to redherringalert.wordpress.com. A lot more information, breaking information going on that I couldn't even show today. Uh, anyway, remember people, if you don't stand up for other people's liberties, who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. God bless. Have a great week. You said to me